August the 20th, 1975, was a very special day for many scientists. It was the day of the Viking One mission to the red planet Mars. As the team of technicians settled down in front of their computers, instruments and monitor screens, the final check of the space vehicle was taking place. Everything was ready. The countdown had begun. This costly space adventure was about to swing into action to prove once and for all that given the right conditions, life could evolve from non-living matter. The basic law of biology states that life can only come from life. Yet, now and again, some scientists suggest that perhaps life could come from non-life. In medieval times, for instance, the scientific world was convinced that vermin and flies were generated directly from rubbish dumps or garbage. In fact, the belief was so strong that in 1668, the celebrated Italian scientist Francesco Redi had to demonstrate, by means of a simple experiment, that vermin and flies breed in garbage, they don't come from it. He placed a piece of meat in three separate flasks. The first flask was covered with a piece of thin cloth, the second with a piece of paper, and the third was left open to the air. Very soon, flies started to enter the open flask and settled on the decaying meat. Although the flies couldn't enter the flask covered with the cloth, they could smell the meat and settled on top. The one covered by paper blocked in the smell and the flies ignored it. After some time, maggots appeared on the meat in the open flask. Maggots also appeared on the thin cloth covering the second flask. The decaying meat in the third flask, however, that was covered by paper, had no maggots on it. It was then obvious to all the scientists that the flies had laid their eggs on the meat in the open flask, and that these had hatched into maggots. As the flies could not get to the meat in the flask covered by the cloth, and could only smell it they laid their eggs on the cloth. The flask covered with paper had no smell of meat, and so the flies were not attracted to it. This flask was free of maggots. Two centuries later, however, belief by scientists in spontaneous generation was again very strong. This time, it concerned the microscopic world of bacteria and algae. They just seemed to come from nowhere. And most people believed they were generated from the matter where they were found. One of the greatest scientists of all time, Louis Pasteur, didn't share this view. He was convinced that the basic law of biology, that only life begets life, was just as good for bacteria as it was for vermin and flies and all other living things. So, before a sceptical audience, he too performed an experiment. He first took a flask, put some broth in it, which he sterilized, and sealed it. No bacteria formed on the broth. Then he used a flask with a narrow S-bend top. As the dust or particles carrying bacteria were blocked in the neck of the flask, no bacteria reached the broth. The scientific world was obliged to accept the facts. A century later, the belief has grown again that life can come from non-living matter. This time, it is believed that long, long ago, primitive life had been developed from primitive gases and chemicals. So, all eyes were fixed on Mars. The reason was that its atmosphere and climate, although extremely cold and dry, is more like Earth's than any other planet. Mars seemed to be just what was required, a sort of natural laboratory floating in space that could settle the question of whether life could evolve from non-life. There would no longer be much doubt that life evolved on Earth if traces of life could be found elsewhere. 
the Viking space rocket was equipped with one of the technological miracles of our day, a miniature science lab capable of performing all the experiments of a modern university laboratory, but only a cubic foot in size. This fantastic apparatus was lowered onto the Martian surface and the experiments began. It was designed to scoop up soil, analyze it with its ultra-modern instruments, and send the results back to Earth. Of one thing, the scientists felt sure. If life was not existing at present, it would have existed in the past. There were indications that surface water had once been present on Mars, and this would have created conditions similar to those that were believed to have originally existed on Earth. The excited scientists could hardly wait to process the data that was pouring into mission control. Then came the shock. It was more like an immense disappointment probably similar to that experienced by their ancestors at the time of Louis Pasteur's experiment. They had been so sure that life could be generated from non-living matter that it was almost unbelievable to find out that the Martian soil was sterile. Not only was there no sign of life, but there was no proof that life had ever existed in the past. They checked and rechecked the data the story was the same. In case they had missed something, a second mission had been organized. The launch of Viking 2 on the 9th of September 1975 rekindled the hopes of some of the scientists. The new data was cold comfort. It just confirmed the truth that no life had ever existed on Mars. Of course, questions started to be asked. After all, an enormous amount of money had been spent, and the believers in evolution theory were farther away than ever from providing any sort of concrete proof for their belief. The investment had provided virtually nil returns, and taxpayers' money seemed to have been used on trying to justify a belief of a number of scientists in a theory unsupported by scientific data. Some were even saying that the results indicated that the whole notion of spontaneous generation evolution should be abandoned. This program takes over where Viking 1 and 2 left off. Scientists are interviewed who have researched various aspects of evolutionary theory to find out what the present position really is. Many people believe that the fossilized remains of animals proves that evolution has taken place in the past. Now, to find out whether this is really the case, let's turn to the science which studies fossils, the science of paleontology. Professor Roberto Fondi is a specialist in paleontology. He teaches at the Department of Earth Sciences in the University of Siena in Italy. Amongst his other activities, he acts as scientific advisor for the reconstruction of prehistoric animals. You may be surprised to know that the fundamental assumptions upon which evolutionary thinking is based are not at all confirmed by paleontology. And what are those assumptions? Firstly, that living cells arose from non-living matter by spontaneous generation. This means that purely as a result of a chain of chemical reactions in a hypothetical primordial soup, a living cell was formed. Secondly, that these cells grouped themselves together into colonies to form complex multicellular structures. These structures were then supposed to transform during the course of time into animals and finally, man. According to these assumptions, the ancestors of all living creatures, including man, can be traced back to a single cell. This ancestry is represented as a gigantic genealogical tree with numerous branches sprouting from a single trunk whose roots sink directly into non-living matter. And doesn't paleontology confirm those assumptions? 
non conferma affatto questa, queste assunzioni. I vari gruppi biologici... Not at all. All the biological groups, from bacteria and blue-green algae to man, appear abruptly in the fossil record without any links connecting them with each other. Why is it then that so many people believe the fossils prove evolution? Bene, eh, la teoria dell'evoluzione viene insegnata... Evolution is presented to grown-ups and taught to the very young as a fact that has been verified and demonstrated for so long that it is a waste of time and even ridiculous to question it. Bene, io nei miei due libri, eh, oltre Darwin... In my books, uh, Beyond Darwin and the Organicistic Revolution, I give the names of well-known scientists who firmly believe evolution is a proven fact, such as George Gaylord Simpson and Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard University. Yet, there are also equally well-known scientists who believe in evolution and admit uh, there is no real proof, uh, such as Emil Guyano of the University of Geneva and G. A. Kierkegaard of Southampton University. Però ammettono pianamente che di essa non c'è nessuna prova. So, what is the truth of the matter? Well, there is a history book of the past, and that is the rocks and the fossilized remains in them. So it is up to the paleontologist to read that book and give the answer. And what do you read in that book, Professor? In questo libro io leggo semplicemente che... The fact is that after nearly two centuries of intense research, the paleontological evidence for evolutionary theory is not only rare, but highly questionable. The point is that if evolution had really happened, the evidence would be in great abundance and incontestable. The museums would be overflowing with fossils, clearly documenting the transitions between the various biological groups. Yet there are none. Moreover, there is no indication that the situation will change in the future. Those very few fossils which are claimed to show some kind of evolutionary link, such as the amphibians Ichthyostica and Simoria, the reptile Propnognognathus, the bird Archaeopteryx, and the Australopithecine ape called Homo habilis, are very far from conclusive. Sono ben lungi dall'essere convincenti. And what about the supposed evolution of man? L'idea dell'uomo come... The idea of gradual evolution of man from such creatures as Australopithecine apes is totally without foundation and should be firmly rejected. Man is not the most recent link in a long chain of evolution. He represents a type or taxon which has existed without any substantial change since his first appearance. The justification for this statement is abundantly clear from my books. So what then, Professor, is your final conclusion? La mia conclusione è che la biologia... Quite simply, that more progress would be made in biology and other disciplines if they kept away from the dead-end roads of evolution mythology and resumed the fruitful approach of Aristotelian, Linnaean, Cuverian and Gothian morphology. Lineano, Cuvieriano e Ghettiano. Biochemistry is the study of the very essence and structure of life. It goes into the very heart of matter into the nucleus of the living cell. No one these days is more qualified to talk about whether one form of living organism could have changed into another than the biochemist. Professor Sermonti, a biochemist, geneticist and molecular biologist of international repute, is just one of those scientists. So let's see what his views are on the subject of evolution. Professor, in the light of present-day molecular biology, how would you view evolution? Well, in fact, the recent discoveries of molecular biology have deeply changed our view on many problems. One of these problems is evolution. In what particular way? The results of molecular biology and genetics 
have shown that the main claim of evolution, namely the fact that mutations are uh, fixed by natural selection, is not true. What natural selection does is just eliminating the novelties which the mutation can create. Natural selection has a stabilizing effect on life. But surely fossils show that animals and plants were different in the past than they are today, so they must have changed. This is not true, because it's a mistake to think that if organisms were different in the past as compared to the present organisms, the present organisms should have derived from those which, has, which have uh, disappeared. They have simply became extinct, but they have not given rise to new organisms. And this is, I would say, a general agreement. Nobody maintains that uh, mammals derive from dinosaurs. It's obviously not the case. So this is a, a general uh, misunderstanding. The fact that in the past we observed different organisms does mean that we derive from these organisms. Evolution theory claims that some organisms, more primitive even than bacteria, have evolved over many years into man. What is your reaction, Professor, to this claim? Well, I feel this is uh, ridiculous. It's impossible. There is no way for a small organism to become man. But still more important is that what looks as a simple organism is, in fact, a very complex biological reality. Even bacteria have a such uh, complex uh, genetic and biochemical makeup that they cannot be derived from uh, simple forms. But does this mean that all living things have always been complex right from the beginning? Yes. This is uh, what uh, molecular biology and genetics have shown, definitely. The complexity is at the beginning. We know from our study of the cell nucleus that the apparatus for making enzymes, for instance, without which no other proteins can be made, is identical from bacteria to man. Since the same main types of creatures and plants alive today were living in the past, it is quite clear that the same complex mechanism of life has existed from the very beginning. To the geneticist, this is a very obvious proof that biochemical evolution has never taken place. One final question, Professor. When did man come onto the scene? How did man? <coughs> Surely there is no evidence that man derived from some uh, primitive animal whatsoever. For what we can say, observing the human chromosomes or the human uh, DNA and comparing it with that of uh, other species is that man is original. Man is not derived from any other species. So the statement that man is a uh, uh, recent creature coming from some uh, primitive form cannot be supported by genetic data at all. One of the problems facing geologists today is the fossilized tree. There are a number of examples in Australia and America and elsewhere where a fossilized tree can be seen running vertically through a number of coal seams. Here's an example from the coal fields of Birmingham in Alabama in the United States. Now, some of these fossilized trees 
12 meters or more in height, can be seen running through a number of banks. This model gives uh, some idea of the situation. Now, the curious thing is that we are told that any one of these banks takes millions of years to form. Now, if this was the case, it would take millions of years to bury the tree. But that's not possible, because the tree would decompose or rot long before it was all buried. So, what is the explanation? Well, a scientist has studied the problem. And the episode you're about to see will give you an idea of the implications of his startling but exciting discovery. Now, in order to understand the explanation, it's important to know the difference between a layer and a bank. These are banks, these areas colored orange and yellow and bluish. In each bank, you can see a number of strata. What you can't see are the layers. You can't see them because as each layer of sediment arrived, it sorted itself out into the banks that you can see. If you could see them, they would look something like this. After you've seen the film, you will understand why. Knowing the difference between a bank and a layer is so important. It not only provides the key to the fossil tree problem, but it also explains why the theory of evolution is crumbling. And what's so important about those rocks? Well, they are not any old rocks. They are made mostly of tiny grains of sediment. They are called sedimentary rocks and cover three quarters of all the land on Earth. And what's more, they were formed under the sea. When the sea level dropped and the sediments were exposed to the air, they dried out to become rocks. Look at this cliff face. You can see it is divided into banks. The bank of sandstone has been coloured yellow, the bank of clay blue, and the limestone coloured orange. Each bank is subdivided into strata. These horizontal lines are strata. To understand the incredible story that this film has to tell, a closer look at the strata in the bank is necessary. They follow a pattern. The larger particles collect together in a line at the bottom, and then the smaller ones gather on top. This pattern is repeated throughout the bank. Sometimes a break or joint can be seen between the top strata in one bank and the bottom strata in the bank on top. These breaks are called stratification joints. For some time now, there's been a suspicion that these rocks contain a secret, which, when discovered, will change our ideas on the most important subject of all. How did mankind originate? One of the first sedimentary rock experts was a German. His name was Johannes Walter. Whilst in Italy, at the end of the last century, he examined the sediments in the Bay of Naples. He discovered by boring vertically downwards through the sediments in the bay, that the banks that lay on top of each other were in the same sequence as those that were lying next to each other horizontally. The sequence of banks that could be seen lying side by side as he went from the coast out to the sea was the same as the sequence of banks that lay on top of each other in a downwards direction. He realized that the belief that the bank at the bottom was older than the one on top was wrong. Quite obviously, all the banks, the one at the top, the one underneath, and the one at the bottom, were all still forming. They were forming sideways, so that part of the top bank was the same age as part of the bottom bank. 
It didn't take Walter very long to work out what caused the banks to form sideways. The particles of sediment coming into the sea from rivers, floods and wind sort themselves according to their size. These larger particles, coloured yellow, stay near to the coast. The less heavy ones, coloured blue, are washed out a little farther. Then the tiny sediments, the orange ones, are carried out by the waves and currents even farther. It can be seen that the layers of new sediment are deposited side by side. The particles of sediment in the layers sort themselves out according to their size into the banks of various types of sediment. This could be a bank of pebbles, this a bank of sandstone, and this one clay. So the banks form sideways. That part of the bank nearest the coast is older than the part of the same bank farther away from the coast. So this part of the bank at the bottom is the same age as this part of the bank at the top. The reaction of the other rock experts was that Johannes Walter's discovery only explained coastal rocks and that deep sea sediments were always formed by a layer of sediment forming on top of another and that the layer on top is always younger than the layer underneath. In this cliff face, probably formed from deep sea sediments, the strata in the banks at the bottom are believed to be much older than the strata up there in the top. The reason for this is that geologists believe that strata and layers are the same thing. In the 1970s and 80s, several holes bored into the bottom of the Pacific Ocean by the Glomer Challenger vessel produced samples of sediment that showed Walter's discovery applied to the deep sea sediments just as well as coastal sediments. This meant that virtually all sedimentary rock formations in the world must have been formed in the same way. So what does all this mean? Well, take what is considered to be the biggest, the widest, the deepest, the longest canyon in the world, the Grand Canyon in the United States. The sides of the canyon display banks, one on top of the other, from the bottom of the mile deep canyon to the top. Each bank is said to indicate an age in geological time. Yet, what we know from Johannes Walter's discovery and the Glomer Challenger deep sea borings indicates that parts of different banks could be the same age. Nevertheless, there were still those who found this difficult to accept. But two recent events have occurred, however, which should remove all further doubts. In 1980, Mount St. Helens, a volcano in the United States, exploded. It flattened an extensive forest and caused a tidal wave in a large local lake. Within hours, 600 feet of sediment had formed which dried into rocks complete with strata. As a result of the explosion, huge amounts of mud flowed through the adjacent rocks and bored a canyon over a hundred feet deep and 200 feet wide. Now, it has always been believed that strata in rocks and canyons take millions of years to form. But both these geological formations were formed within several hours. The other event took place in a laboratory. French sedimentologist Guy Berthaud discovered two immensely important facts. The first was that sand, flowing continuously, whether in a vacuum, in the air, or in the water, sorts itself out into alternating deposits of large and small particles that look like layers, but are not layers. The second vital fact emerged during the program of experiments he was directing with the State University of Colorado. Looking through the transparent sides of a large tank or flume, 
he studied the particles of sediment in the moving water. He observed that when the speed of the current was reduced, only the large particles of sediment were deposited. And when the current was increased, microstrata started to form. So the grading of particles in strata was not just the result of layers of sediment piling up on top of each other, as had always been thought. The grading could simply be due to variations in the speed of the current when the particles were deposited. A further startling discovery was that joints or breaks between strata are the result of desiccation or drying out of sediment. It used to be thought that these joints were caused by an interruption in the supply of sediment. It was thought that the surface of the last deposited strata had hardened and that many years later new sediments started to fall and a new strata formed on top of the old one. This theory now has to be abandoned because of two new discoveries. The first was that the underwater borings of Gloma Challenger showed that surface sediments under the sea never harden. In fact, hardening of sediments only starts 300 meters below the seabed. The only known exception is chert sediments, which even so only start hardening 100 meters below the sea bottom. The second discovery was in the laboratory. It was found that when the sea level drops and the damp sediments are exposed to the air, breaks occur between some of the strata as part of the drying out process. So these joints or breaks have nothing to do with time. These experiments, performed by a team of experts over many months under the most rigorous laboratory conditions, have been filmed and are available for all to see. They confirm the most important fact ever discovered in the history of sedimentology. Strata provide no indication of age. Guy Berthaud has shown that the strata you see in these banks are caused by changes in water currents. They don't just deposit themselves one upon the other over vast periods of time. They form sideways in a crab-like fashion, just like the banks. So, why is this important? Well, quite simply, because strata have been used to date sedimentary rocks and the fossils in them for over 100 years. And now, for the first time ever, there is experimental proof to show how strata form. And it is quite obvious that strata cannot be used to date either fossils or rocks. In fact, the fossils in the bottom strata could be younger than the fossils in the top strata. Here you see some sea creatures which live at different ecological levels. A heavy influx of sediment arrives and they all get buried. Eventually, if no air gets to them, they could turn into fossils. Obviously, those buried in the top strata are the same age as those in the bottom strata, as they were buried in the same layer of sediment. Then another heavy layer of sediment arrives and more sea creatures are trapped. But what is more important is the ones at the top of the previous layer were buried before the one in the bottom of the last layer. So the one at the top here is older than the one at the bottom. Let the director of the research program explain. La théorie de l'évolution Evolution theory is based upon the belief that a succession of fossil species in a scale of geological time demonstrates that evolutionary progress has taken place. As we have just seen, however, and as we have shown in the laboratory, layers of incoming sediment have been wrongly identified as being strata. The scale of geological time 
and the chronological succession of fossils have been calculated on this mistaken belief that strata are successive layers of sediment. A single layer of sediment can sort itself out into parts of many strata. So the position of fossils, rather than sharing evolution, merely indicates the distribution of marine species which lived at different depths. The theory of evolution is therefore unsupported by geology. The next question is, if the creatures fossilized in the rocks show no evolutionary sequence, could they have all lived together at the same time? Since we now know that rocks don't need time to form, just enough sediment, there appears to be some reason to believe that they could have all been living together. What we see is an immense graveyard encircling the earth of hundreds of millions of fossilized creatures who could have all been victims of the same catastrophe. The very fact that their remains were buried in vast quantities of sediment which has become rock and that this kind of rock is only made by water strongly indicates that the catastrophe was a cataclysmic flood that covered the entire earth. How old is the Earth? Is it millions of years or just a few thousand years? And what does radiometric dating tell us about the age of rocks? The science of physical chemistry can throw some light on these questions. And Professor Edward Bordreau is a physical, inorganic chemist who teaches at a university in New Orleans, Louisiana, and he has studied these matters. So he should be able to help us. Professor Bordreau. It is explained elsewhere in the program that the strata and the fossils in the rock can give no indication as to the age of those rocks. Can you tell us if there are any other methods by which the rocks of the strata can be dated? For example, by carbon-14 dating. Well, let us get one thing clear about carbon-14. It is an unstable radioactive form of the element carbon, which occurs in all living matter. A living organism, when it's alive, is absorbing and expelling carbon, a small amount of which is carbon-14. And at some point in time when an organism dies, the carbon-14 that was present, remaining at the point of death, is what would be detected radioactively. A piece of wood, for example, or a bone, would contain a small amount of carbon-14. Uh, when the the, the tree which bore the wood, or the animal which bore the bone, died. That carbon-14 that remained is decaying. It takes thousands of years for the decay process to occur. About 5,760 years for half an original amount of carbon-14 to decay into a stable isotope of carbon-12. So by measuring how much of it has decayed, an indication of how long ago the organism was alive can be obtained. As rocks were never alive, they contain no carbon-14. Even the fossils in the rocks cannot be dated by this method because the original living matter in them has turned into stone. Does this mean that the fossils can't be dated by radioisotopes? Well, certainly not by carbon-14 with any degree of reliability. As you know, Virtually all the fossils are found in sedimentary rocks, and because this type of rock rarely contains radioactive elements, the fossils have had to be dated by rock strata in which they are found. And as we know, the latest experiments show that rock strata give no indication of age. Other types of rocks, such as crystalline rocks, which do not contain fossils, and lava, do sometimes contain radioactive elements, and these isotopes are used to date them. Can you tell us, in simple terms, how you date a fossil or rock with a radioisotope? Yes. Uh, let us take a radioactive element such as uranium. This element decays very slowly into a non-radioactive element, which is lead. Now, the rate of the decay 
can be measured in the laboratory. So by comparing what's left of the uranium element in the rock with the amount of decayed lead element that was formed, and knowing the rate of decay, an idea can be had of how long it has taken for the lead to form. So if half of the uranium has decayed into lead, and by knowing how long it takes for uranium to decay into lead, yes. you can tell the age of the rock. That's the theory. Why do you say theory? Surely if it's a process you can observe and measure, it must be a fact. Not at all. Look again at the diagram. You can see that there are a number of uranium particles, the orange ones, and a number of lead particles, the blue ones. Here we have to make three major assumptions. The first is that all of the lead particles were originally uranium particles, but there is no reason to believe that there were not some lead particles in the rock when it was formed. You see, there is plenty of natural lead in rocks that doesn't come from uranium at all. Really? Yes. Let us take the extreme case. If this rock contained radioactive uranium and no lead, then the lead that would appear as a consequence of uranium decay would be a fairly accurate measurement of the age of that rock. Or to take a more likely situation that at least some of the lead was in the rock when it was formed, then the age of the rock is much less than we are led to believe. Then there's the matter of leaking out due to solubility. Could that happen? Most definitely. Salts of uranium and uh, other radioactive elements uh, are quite uh, capable of dissolving in water and uh, therefore will be removed from the sample. So if the rock had been exposed to water for some period of time, such as during a flood, some of the uranium could have been washed out. This would mean that the age ascribed to the rock would be much too great. But surely there must be other radioactive uh, material and elements which are more reliable than uranium. Well, there's radioactive thorium, and uh, there is uh, strontium uh, and rubidium, uh, and there's potassium. Uh, but these are no more reliable than uranium. Uh, the salts of these latter elements are even more soluble in water than the uranium salts. So a worldwide flood would have made all these methods useless. Uh, most definitely. Let me give you an example of how water can affect radioactive dating. Less than 200 years ago, the Hawaiian volcano Kiolue uh, erupted, and uh, the lava which uh, emerged from that eruption was submerged in water. It was subsequently dated by the potassium argon method. Clearly, it should have shown the age of the lava to be about 200 years. The date recorded, however, was 22 million years. Obviously, the highly soluble potassium salt had leaked out of the sample and left it looking very old. Other samples taken from Haululai'i volcano lava from 1801 were dated between 160 million and 3,000 million years old. The situation gets worse and worse. But there's also another assumption in radiometric dating, and that is that the rate of decay has remained constant and has not been influenced in the past. There are a number of things which uh, could have uh, influenced uh, rates of decay. Such as? Uh, well, the... Uh, production of neutrinos from uh, cosmic radiation could have been enhanced uh, by a reversal of the Earth's magnetic field or the explosion of a supernova in a nearby star. Uh, science uh, has proclaimed that uh, these events have occurred in the past, and they could have a substantial effect, therefore, on the radioactive decay rate. So, if radiometric dating is no guide, what other methods are available? There are a great many natural processes which uh, date the Earth to be relatively young. For example, if the compelling evidence that the Earth's magnetic field has been decreasing with time is a fact, then we would find that the Earth would be rather young rather than old. Uh, there is also the question of uh, cosmic dust coming from outer space, which is falling at a relative, re uh, regular rate on the Moon and on the Earth. 
it has been calculated what the rate of this dust should be. In view of the fact that there is no wind or water erosion on the moon, the cosmic dust would just pile up. According to radiometric dating, the moon and the earth are supposed to be four and a half billion years old. So the amount of cosmic dust on the undisturbed moon surface should have been many meters thick. When the astronauts landed on the moon's surface, they were astonished to find only a few centimeters of dust. The sort of thickness that would take less than 10,000 years to form. One final question, Professor Bordeaux. In your opinion, how long ago did the Big Bang take place? The whole Big Bang hypothesis was constructed to support evolution theory. Without evolution theory, there's no Big Bang. It's difficult to believe that all those biologists, zoologists, and other scientists can be wrong. After all, they've been trained in the world's leading universities. Perhaps Professor Maciej Giertich of the Polish Academy of Sciences Institute of Dendrology, who lectures in population genetics at the Torun University in Poland, can help us. A good scientist is one who bases his conclusions on experimental data and observations. Scientists who study genetics, cytology, anatomy, or any other field of experimental sciences is good and reliable, regardless what he thinks about evolution. Science works very well this way. Where things do go wrong is when someone claims to be an expert in evolution. Why do you say that? Because evolution is not a science, it is a philosophy. Since scientists trust each other, they often accept the claim of evolutionists that evolution is a science. But it is not. It is uh, the opinion of theoretical biologists and philosophers that evolution is a science. But is there no scientific evidence for evolution? Uh, what is claimed to be a, an evidence for evolution is the universally observable fact that every organism has parents, or at least one parent. Now this coupled with the uh, knowledge that there was a time when there were no ants, no frogs, no men, leads to the unscientific postulate that uh, the first frog was born of a non-frog, the first ant of a non-ant, the first human of a non-human, and so on. Why do you say this idea is unscientific? Because the available evidence does not support it. The science of genetics clearly shows that such change is not possible. The evolutionists go even further. They claim that uh, living things have evolved from non-living matter. But if there is no scientific data to support the evolutionist claims, how is it they manage to convince so many other scientists that evolution is a scientific fact? Uh, their main argument is that there are small uh, positive or be beneficial mutations occur in the reproduction cells and are retained by natural selection. These mutations, they say, accumulate and cause a species to gradually change into another species. <laughs> Now, I am a geneticist, and I can confirm that in all the studies, in all laboratories around the world, where many generations of organisms have been produced, nowhere have positive mutations have ever been observed. And also, in the most studied population of all, the human population, all known mutations are either neutral or harmful. They are never an improvement. In fact, uh, nature is programmed to protect genes from changes and to correct uh, errors that have occurred. But if mutations don't cause changes, what causes all the different varieties of animals and the different types of men? Uh, the varieties come from recombinations, from the mixing of genes during sexual reproduction. Organisms adapted to a set of conditions will concentrate in an environment that has these conditions. By interbreeding, they will form a population which uh, has the 
uh, what we call a, becomes a variety. Now also, uh, if by accident a population is isolated, some features uh, may concentrate in that population and give it a distinct appearance. This is what we call genetic drift. But don't these varieties represent some form of evolution? Well, many people claim that uh, through this process, new biological types would, uh, will arise. But this is not so. All that has happened is that some genes have been segregated out from the population, and the population that we uh, obtain is impoverished. It is poorer in gene content. No new genes have been formed. Now, if there are no new genes, there's no potential for new organs, no potential for new organisms. Uh, just a different variety of the same species resulted. Uh, we do this ourselves, ourselves all the time in breeding. By selection and isolation, uh, we obtain new varieties of animals and plants. We select horses, cows, uh, dogs, and so on also in plants, cereals, uh, vegetables, and so on, uh, we select those which are useful to man, which have certain characteristics and that are of special interest to us. But these populations are uh, restricted in the genetic pool, and uh, they are very much dependent on the conditions, on the external conditions, uh, that are provided for them. Uh, they are dependent on the conditions that man will create for them. And if they are left alone, they will either die, or uh, they will, uh, if they survive, they will return to the wild state. Uh, they will cease to be a, a, a separate variety. So, if life forms are more resistant in their natural state, any change that takes place in nature would perhaps be long-lasting. Just mixing of genes, whether in natural conditions or in domesticated conditions, does not provide new genes. For evolution, we need new genes full of new genetic information. There is no natural process known to science which will produce these uh, new genes, neither by isolation, selection, uh, mutation, or breeding. This is not possible. But why is it then that children are taught that one species can evolve into another? Well, I think it is because evolutionists are unwilling to face the fact that genes contain so much useful information, information needed uh, for the precise functions that the organisms have to perform. It is since we have uh, been learned how to read the genetic code that we have become aware of the mass of information contained in the genes. Uh, there's no known way to, sci of, to science of how this information can arise spontaneously. It requires an intelligence. It cannot arise from ch chance events. Uh, just mixing letters does not produce poetry. The science of molecular biology makes it clear that never in the past could there have been such a thing as a simple organism. All organisms however primitive they may appear, are complex and bursting with information. And we know that this information must have been there from the very beginning. For example, the very complex DNA, RNA, protein, replicating system in the cell must have been perfect from the very start. If not, life systems could not exist. The only logical explanation is that this vast quantity of information came from intelligence. Every bacterium, every microscopic cell is so precisely programmed that we have to assume that the information contained within it comes from an intelligence far beyond our own. The evolutionists do not want to accept this self-evident fact. As a result, they are producing theories which are of no scientific value because they do not provide any ideas how new genetic information is produced. Now the curious thing is that the school textbooks and the reference books in natural history continue to say that evolution is an established fact. Yet, as this program has shown, in the light 
of current scientific knowledge. Far from being a fact, the scientists are saying that evolution doesn't even appear to be an acceptable hypothesis. The idea of gradual evolution of man from such creatures as Australopithecine apes is totally without foundation and should be firmly rejected. So the statement that man is a, a recent creature coming from some uh, primitive form cannot be supported by genetic data at all. La théorie de l'évolution. The theory of evolution is therefore unsupported by geology. There are a great many natural processes which uh, date the earth to be relatively young. Because evolution is not a science, it is a philosophy. A number of scientists are making the same point. They say that if people continue to believe in evolution theory, despite the now overwhelming evidence against it, that they must be doing so for philosophical reasons and not for scientific ones. The new discovery showing that rock strata form sideways is, of course, enormously important. Fossil species, for instance, can no longer be arranged into evolutionary trees. It also explains why the fossil links between the different kinds of animals and the different kinds of plants have never been found. Finally, what about cavemen? Surely they indicate that primitive man evolved into civilized man? Here again, the caveman story has been based on the theory of evolution and the fossil remains in the rocks. We now know that the sedimentary rocks provide no information about age, and most of the rocks could have been formed from one and the same catastrophic flood. So the fossilized remains of cavemen could simply be of people living in caves at the time of the catastrophe, who had been cut off from civilization. Even in recent times, people have been discovered in remote parts of the world living primitive lives in caves. If the majority of sedimentary rocks were formed from the same cataclysm, there is no reason why life on Earth cannot be measured in thousands of years rather than millions. The scientists presented in this program are just a sample of several thousand who've reached the same conclusion that evolution theory is really a fairy tale for grown-ups. <laughs>